Hello, everyone, and welcome back to episode two of Coaching Christy. This is Andrew Beluga Whale Seidman with the lovely Christy Arnett. Hey, guys. And uh, one thing that I realized I forgot to tell you guys in last week's video is that as part of my coaching program, it's very important that we identify a proper nickname. Um, I know Joe the Pro is the best in the world at this, uh, but I tried my hand with Christy, and we came up with a very special nickname. Um, so presenting for the first time on, on air, Christy the Ninja Dolphin Arnett. All right. This the is reason, a little photo yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we, we, this is our, her logo, her upcoming logo for superstardom. Um, <laughs> we chose a dolphin because dolphins are sleek, and while they eat fish, sharks are also afraid of them. And it's actually kind of stunning to me that nobody else has been a dolphin. But we also decided that just Christy the dolphin wasn't quite cool enough, <laughs> um, especially given the fact that she's Asian and, uh, <laughs> and that her avatar on Full Tilt is a ninja. So we developed the most fearsome of all creatures, the ninja dolphin. Um, and so if you see this symbol around, have no fear, it means the ninja dolphin is there. <laughs> all right. Sick. Yeah, just to, make it, just to make it clear, that's a ninja dolphin, not a ninja, like, killing a dolphin or anything. No, not stabbing the dolphin, not even riding the dolphin. The ninja and the dolphin are the same thing. They're, yeah. they're just super mysterious and sleek and fast and very intelligent, and they're the only animals on Earth who have sex for pleasure. Awesome. There you go. <laughs> Okie doke. Uh, we are now uh, into our second video where we've got four tables once again of 25 cent, 50 cent on full tilt. Um, this is actually a continuation of last week's episode, so we do have um, some potential uh, continuing situations. We've tangled a little bit with this guy on our left, uh, our guy on a couple of tables named Paul Rizzo, um, and uh, we've seen some action from a variety of other players, Shores, T. Um, and so we should be able to, and we know that this one, two, one, two Kings on the top right table is a fish. And I assume that's why you're raising the King nine suited in mid position. Is that right? Yes, definitely. Good. So why don't we roll the tape and while we're rolling it, um, you can tell me how your play has been going over the, the last few days since we've been doing this. Uh, well, that's what I get for bragging because I was like the last video I said, you know, <clears throat> I've been doing really well. And kind of building up my role uh, enough to almost enough to play fifty cent a dollar, but had a couple setbacks last night. And I was telling, uh, I told you about it. Uh, the last video, you said, you know, we have a plan and we're going to stick to it. And if you are against a passive player and they go all in and you call with second set and they have top set, well, that's okay because that's part of the plan. I'm, it's not like I'm calling off with ace king or top pair or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I got a couple situations where. I felt like I made the right play, um, and you know, against a bad aggressive player, I made a, a good call, and got a little unlucky. So stuff like that, like knowing that I have a plan and sticking with it, and even if I'm running bad, I still feel okay about it. But I'm a little farther away from uh, playing fifty cents a dollar, but but it's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I mean, the limits aren't so important. I do have one question though. If we could pause that tape for a second. Yeah. Um. Uh. On the uh, the top right table, mm -hmm. um, we raised the king nine suited, which we said was fine. Um, and the only action in this hand that actually interests me is the turn. Okay. The flop is very fine, and the river is very easy once we hit a flush. Um, but so the turn, I want you to walk me through this again. It's something we do a lot. It's a process that we get really in the habit of doing. But I want you to go through both parts here. So walk me through your turn turn th thought process. Um, okay, so can I bet for value? Um, if he calls me, right, no. So, so I can't. So can I bet as a bluff? Do I have full equity and do I have pot equity? Obviously, I have pot equity because mm -hmm. I have a good draw, an overcard. And, but I just thought that I couldn't, I didn't have that much full equity because um, we're, we're both so deep and because, um, or would that mean the opposite? Because we're deep, I have more, or less. In theory, because you're deep, you would have more. Okay. Okay. Um, I just didn't think that I was that that was a card I could get him to fold anything that he was calling with on the flop. And yet but, you made a bet. Um, I, I don't remember if I did. I guess you I did. Sure did. <laughs> <laughs> um. No, it's one of those things where it's like it's actually we have so much pot equity here that I really don't even mind making a bet. Um, that said, the most important thing to consider here is our player type. 
Mm -hmm. Um, we're going up against a guy who is really unlikely to fold anything in his range here. Um, and so in that sense, like it's, uh, you know, we have the necessary pot equity. Um, and I, I, we talked about this last week a little bit saying we have to make sure we don't talk ourselves into thinking we have more fold equity than we do. Mm -hmm. um, which is a really, really common thing to do. That said here, we probably have just enough to make a bet plus EV. The only question is whether or not a bet is more plus EV than a check. And I would actually be surprised here if a check wasn't a little bit better than a bet. Okay. Um, just because I don't expect this guy really to fold anything. Um, mm -hmm. He honestly I mean, could very well call us with ace high to the point where, like, if we brick out on the river, we're probably going to check. Mm -hmm. Because you know we're, we're definitely not moving him off a pair at that point once all the draws miss, and so we break out on the river and we check and lose to ace high. Like the whole scene kind of sucks. Whereas like he's definitely, definitely, definitely going to either bluff if he's got ace high on the river if the if the diamond comes, um, or he's going to pay off you know a big bet anyway on the river if he has any kind of pair. So I think we're actually probably better off uh, checking the turn. But it is close. It is close. We may be able to get him to fold some stuff that we that we thought we couldn't. He may fold ace high. He may fold pocket fours. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so. And so there, you know, there there is a decent argument for for making a bet here. It's pretty close, but just want to make sure that you had you had, we're once again not overestimating your your ability to get someone like that to fold. And that's another question I had. When you have so much pot equity, like when, but you have a lot of pot equity, but you have a lot of fold equity because you know, say you've got like a a pair and a flush draw, mm -hmm. and a gut and a gut shot or something. Where do you draw the line between? Like, when does it become value? When does it become you're, you're trying to, I mean, and it, with a hand like that, are you trying, are you going to still try to move them off a hand? You know what I'm saying? Like, I, well, I don't so, know. So, okay, so, so basically what you find is this, is you find that um, the more pot equity you have, the, the fewer hands you need to move them off of. So let's say, for example, that, like, if we had queen jack on a 10-9-6 board, or 10-9-5 board, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. We might be able to say, oh, if we you know, put in a, a, a check race here, a big race, we might be able to get him to fold a nine, right? Mm -hmm. Then let's say we are all of a sudden add the fact that we have a flush draw there. So I have two overcards, a flush draw and a straight draw. Now we don't even need him to fold a nine like we wanted the call with a nine, and now we're value betting. So really the increase in equity takes us closer and closer and closer to value betting, which is actually an interesting point if you think about the way value betting actually works. When we have a lot of equity, we're betting. We have like more than 50% equity. We're betting for value. Mm -hmm. So like if we have top pair or like on this river, we obviously have 100% equity. But like if we have top pair, we're betting because we have like 70% equity and, you know, expect him to call, call with worse. When we bet with like 40% equity, it's because we need him to fold, you know, a, a slight amount of the time. If we're betting with 10% equity, we need him to fold a lot. Okay. Um, and uh, – and so it's a difficult question to answer because there's really no way to exactly identify right. fold equity. You right. know what I mean? Even mm -hmm. if you could I exactly identify his range, it would be impossible to know what – especially what a bad player is going to do exactly with those cards. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. let's – you know, sometimes that guy might be feeling like Colin with ace eye. Sometimes he might be folding. It's very difficult to know. All we can do is basically guess about trends. And the trends that we're going to go with are what we've already talked about. You know, bad players unlikely to fold. Good players may be more able to make a fold if you know if you're representing something accurately. Um, so you know, this is why we basically save our bluffs for the good aggressive players, um, mm -hmm. because you know that's you know it's the next level that we're going to talk about. Now, one thing that I do want to talk about today, actually, is uh, we have this whole philosophy of pot equity plus fold equity. Mm -hmm. um, and I've talked about this in a million videos and probably to the point where a lot of people are really tired of hearing me say the same same shit over and over and over and over again. Um, that said, there is actually a really important adjustment that I've recently thought of that we need to make with this sometimes, which is that there are times when we actually don't want to uh, use this. <laughs> um, and I'll talk about when maybe a little bit later, like perhaps after we pause the tape. Um, okay. But uh, – there are important times where we might look at pot equity and say, man, I have a lot of pot equity. This is definitely a check. Or I have a lot of uh, – I have no pot equity. This is definitely a bet, which I know sounds totally backwards. Um, but we're going to talk about when those cases uh, arise. Okay. All right. So we bet the turn there. I'm hoping for value. Uh, yes. Six. And – yeah. Well. So now what's our plan on this river if he bets? To call? Definitely. Uh, He's because... going to call on the turn with any seven, with any um, 
uh, with any club draw, probably with any ace, and he may well bet all those on the river. So I think that that's a very, very good plan of what we talked about the other day, actually, or last week, um, of this keeping their heads down line. This basic, mm-hmm. basic idea of, oh, I'm going to bet for thin value on the turn with a lot of draws out there and check call if all the draws miss. Mm-hmm. So good. Good, good, good. Um, East five, so far, so good. The set, so far, so good. Um, it'd be interesting to see what happens if this guy calls us over on the king three two board. But he doesn't. See, this is what I mean. This is why, like, people say, "Oh, I have a hard time beating small stakes." You know, push those edges right there with that ace five. You know what I mean? Think about how easy that money was. <laughs> yeah. You just three bet and he calls and then you see bet and he folds. And mm-hmm. the ability to keep on hammering that over and over again and to prevent ourselves from doing that same thing um, is so, 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 so critical. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked uh, a lot. I don't know if we talked about it that much last week, but when we were doing our coaching about um, the creation of dead money. Remember that? Yeah. And how I said there were two types of dead money. There's uh, passive dead money and aggressive dead money. Remember that too or is that getting too too far? Uh, I don't think we talked a lot, a lot about that, but yeah, I don't think we did either, but it's the kind of thing where I'd say, you know, if, if we, we want to make our raise size preflop smaller, if we think there's good players in the blind so that we don't create aggressive dead money, mm-hmm. right? Somebody calling a three bit out of position and playing fit or fold is creating passive dead money. There's okay. no way they can win that pot unless they hit. Mm-hmm. And that's what passive dead money is all about. It's, you know, making basically relying on luck to win a pot, um, uh, by by just calling. If you if you raise or if you're betting, you can uh, not call in position with a seven suited there. But um, <laughs> if, yeah. if you uh, I'm gonna put this quickly in the notes so we don't forget to talk about it. Um, calls not deep enough. I'm um, sorry. Write a note to myself. Um, if we're betting or raising, this is sort of classic, you know, Doyle Brunson stuff. You have two ways to win the pot. You can win by making the best hand, or you can win by uh, getting him to fold. And so, like that, in that sense, like aggressive dead money is a much better thing to be creating than passive dead money. Which is why we say we're never going to call three bets um, uh, out of position because it's just too difficult to avoid creating a lot of passive dead money. Kind of like it's really difficult to avoid creating a lot of passive dead money with a seven suited here. You know what I mean? Kind of what we're doing here right now is um, not really taking any kind of aggressive line with our hand um, against him. Now, I mean, obviously, it's not super bad because we're, we're not floating, obviously, to, to try to get the showdown. We're floating to try to take the pot away. And uh, your bet size here is looking like it's about to be too big. But you kind of fix it at the last second, which is not so bad. So good job to you. Um, mm-hmm. Because, you know, we're thinking about what is this extra money actually going to buy us? And the answer is not enough. Now, my fear here is that he's going to check shove with anything that's got a diamond in it, mm-hmm. um, which puts us in bad shape. Um, in general, I would say that unless we were deeper, we should right. probably just fold this hand preflop. Okay. Um, there's a few different responses we could take to a three bet. Um, the best one for these limits is going to be play really tightly. Okay. Um, now, if you're up against someone who's really aggro, then that's not so bad. It's not like we talked about. It's not a bad hand to, to be having a three-bet pot. We're in position. We've got a high card, and we're suited. You know? It's not the worst thing in the world, um, but it's one of those things where it's like, unless we're a little bit deeper and we could use position a little bit more, um, we're going to find ourselves just being too passive too often. You know? Mm-hmm. And a good player there is going to have a lot of hands that he's either double-barreling or check-shoving the turn with there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I think that uh, I'm happy it worked out, but I think it's just a full preflop. Yeah, that makes sense, definitely. So and the I five know, nine off—that's showing some confidence right there. Well, we were—it was only three three handed because everybody else was sitting out and I was on the button. So I thought I have a, I have a really good question for you. Yes. How does the button change three handed versus six handed? Guess it doesn't, does it? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> it's like if you if you're playing three handed, just imagine that like six guys just folded in front of you. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, if you're yeah, yeah. Playing the button like, you know, nine handed. Just imagine that you were playing three handed, and it's still the button. The button's the button's okay. the button. Right. Um. Now that's not entirely true. Like certain 
elements of psychology start to get involved when people play shorter handed versus like you know longer handed like if people play like nine handed everyone kind of in general is playing a little tighter it's just like kind of the way that people think um but that said that's not significant enough especially at these limits to change our button play in any way the mm-hmm. buttons the buttons the button that said i i, I don't you know I, i'm not hating on the nine five <laughs> it's pretty bad but it is connected to e and it has a nine <laughs> So I guess it could be okay. <laughs> um, okay, so up here, this guy just Jim Beam limps. And I have a hand like pack of fives. And yep. you were talking about, okay, I guess I was kind of confused. And I, I think I had an opposite in my head. Okay. So if I needed, if I was going to create aggressive dead money, that's when I'm going to be aggressive, right? Well, that's anytime someone's aggressive, they're basically creating uh, potentially aggressive dead money. Um, and so like... For example, if you bet there and then take a raise, you're clearly creating aggressive dead money, right? Because you can't you can't fold you you can't call with your hand if you if you make a raise. Um, we should be much happier just c betting um, that flop though. Yeah, no. For some reason, I think my yeah we timed so, out. Yeah. Yeah, it lagged it or something because all of a sudden I was trying to bet and all of a sudden it timed me out, but. Um, um, but basically what I would say about those pocket fives is we're betting because we think the other guys – we're raising pre-flop because we think the other guy's going to create a lot of pass at dead money by just mm-hmm. folding the flop all the time, which is you know, our, our net, that's just why we would see bet there. Um, and the sort of element of value that comes with it is not only do we have the best hand almost always there, pre-flop, mm-hmm. um, but we're going to make great decisions with our hand later. And a lot of people underestimate like the value of decision-making, how much value that adds to your hand. Um, mm-hmm. But it is significant. Okay, so in that case, if I wanted to create that dead money, well, with put it, let, like let's, him, let's make sure we get this right because we don't want to create dead money. Okay. But it's going to happen in the process of trying to collect dead money. Okay. Uh, Any time that we put money in the pot where we would fold to further action, that money is dead. Our hand is dead. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and which which is a great argument for raising because a lot of times people put money in the pot where they would fold to a raise, and every time they do, their hand is dead to a raise. You know what I mean? Okay, yeah. Um, and so we don't necessarily want to be creating dead money. We want to collect other people's dead money. So to collect his, like, I, I was going to say, should I make my raise bigger because... Well, this is the reason why we say we make it as big as we, can, as we think we can get away with against bad players preflop, but okay. as small against good players as, as possible. Yeah. Because the, the more we make it... Um, uh, Pre, the more likely there's, there's, they're still just going to check fold. You know, the more likely we are to just win more money with our c bets. Um, against regulars, it doesn't work like that because they'll three bet us. <laughs> you know, they'll, mm-hmm. they won't just c- create dead money like passive dead money. They'll create aggressive okay. money, which they'll essentially be coming after us. Um, I don't like your flop call with pocket tens there. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. And, um, so he, this guy's a regular, obviously. That I made a little mark on him. So. When should I be not just calling with pocket tens or hands like that and, and four betting? Or was the call there? The call, the call preflop is fine, but the, the question that you need to ask yourself is, can I get value with my hand here? Mm-hmm. Right? And I think with pocket tens, like, the answer is no, because if right. four bet, we're going to have to call a shove, and we're not going to be good against a shove. Now, the only way we could say, well, that's, that's not an answer to the question of, is four betting this hand plus EV? Which it definitely is plus EV. But calling is almost certainly more plus EV, especially if you think that he's three-betting you with like shooting connectors and stuff, which a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of regular shit this limit might do. Mm-hmm. Um, or even like ace rag. Yeah, even ace rag, like we're in great shape. Um, so just on that kind of flop, the ace low low, just kind of just give up. On why, don't, why don't we pause the tape for a second? Because we got a couple interesting spots going on. Okay. Um. Okay. Uh, number one. Are we are we paused yet? We're not paused yet. Are oh, we? sorry. Yeah. Um. Okay. Um. Hand the the two hands that are really interesting are the top right and the bottom left. Mm-hmm. So why don't we start with the top right? Um. We threw a bit from the blinds with Jack Eight Suit. This is starting to get a little bit thin for value. You know what mm-hmm. I mean, our hand is starting to get a little bit low and not quite connecty enough to be really happy about it. But it's not so bad. This is just be should just be like the sort of bottom tier mm-hmm. of what we would do. Um. That said, we spike a lot of equity on the flop, so the C-bet is clearly fine. And once he calls, I'm pretty inclined to make another bet on the turn because I think we can get worse hands to fold. You know what I mean? Okay. I think that the pot is really, really big. I think that we can potentially get a hand like 
pocket tens uh, to fold on the turn. Mm-hmm. Pocket mm-hmm. tens, certainly any type of float. Um, a lot of hands like ace queen, ace jack, ace ten that might have floated, and even potentially, by the way, we might be able to get them to fold um, uh, some um, some hands that you know have. I guess that, I was going to say basically the same thing I was just saying. Basically, hands hands that have hands that have equity against us. If we do bet there, we obviously have to call call it shove, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, if he calls with one street with a king and then James the turn, that's fine. But we actually expect a lot of players, if they flop a big king there, to put in a raise or something like that. Um, like ace king will probably put in a raise there if it has it. Um, so there's not that many kings relative to other random things he could have. Uh, I think we can bet there again and feel okay about it. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, bottom left table. Um, and once he checks, or once we check and he bets, we have to either check shove or check fold um, right. against these types of players. Um, I, my inclination is still to check fold, but given what I just said, I feel like we probably have to check shove. Um, that there's not not as many kings as other stuff. The reason why I, I, maybe we should check fold is because a lot of the other stuff that we expect him to have are random pair hands that he checks back. Mm-hmm. Um, however, the reason that the one reason that might make us want to shove is that he makes his bet so big. You know. He he bet seventeen fifty into twenty two dollars. Like if he doesn't understand dead money, this would be a great pot to take down without a showdown. You know what I mean? If he's mm-hmm. bluffing here, so I don't know. This is really really close, and I think you could make a good argument for both check shoving and check folding. Um, in this in the name of fun, I suppose we should check shove. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I wouldn't really hate either decision there. Okay. Um. Okay. Bottom left table. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh. There's a a min raise, a call, and we re raise. Um, with Ace King, and we take a cold uh, four bet from the blinds. Mm-hmm. At this limit, I would fold Ace King to that. Okay. Um, just because uh, people aren't don't do that out of line very often, unless you think they're like, unless you know they're bad aggressive. Okay. You know what I mean, that makes sense. if yeah. they're bad aggressive, then we're like super psyched, and we probably we should probably just re-raise all in. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, because, you know, a lot of times bad aggressive players will put in their, like we saw the uh, last week with the ace eight against their queen five. You know what I mean? They put yeah. in the raise, like they might as well call it all off with their queen five or whatever. Um, obviously, once we spike a king, we're not going to be able to fold. Um, because the pot's too big and, you know, it's just there's just too few combos of pocket aces left. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but uh, uh, without knowing that he's bad aggro, we should just fold the preflop. Now, okay. I know everyone out there is going, ah, uh, you can't fold ace-king pre-flop. And once we get, like, a limit or two higher, we probably will rarely ever find a spot to fold ace-king pre. Um, but once we're in micros, like, a cold four bet, yeah, it's the range is too tight to play ace-king profitably. Okay. Okay? Yeah, definitely. Um, just think about how often you get cold four bet at these limits. Not right. very often. Right, right. Um... You know, and clearly, clearly, we're gonna we're gonna jam once we hit top pair. But I would expect us to lose very often here to ace, aces or pocket kings, mm-hmm. um, given the action. I think a little of the reason why I was more inclined to call was because the first raise was a min raise. Right. So I was thinking that it was I don't know since it's such a weak raise, it's not. It was, he he might be more inclined to four bet with not just aces or kings, so. I mean I don't know. that's potentially true, but I would just think about you know what you know what I would guess someone's cold four betting range would look like, and most mm-hmm. likely right by the way right now he's timing he's tanking with pocket queens. Right. right. And the fact that he folds them is a great argument for us not playing our hand like that. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I missed the action up here on the on the A7 hand. Can we rewind that for a second and we can take a yeah. look at it? Yeah, yeah. All right, so we raised preflop um, with, uh, against the limper, which is fine. Um, and... Uh, is it... Is it... It's like the tape is paused. No, we're good now. Okay. Um... Yeah, I mean, clearly, clearly raising the A7 suited is fine against the limper. We've talked about this a lot. Creation of dead money, collecting, you know, collecting dead money against the fish, getting value, blah 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 blah. Um, warning sign number one is we bet here and take a raise. Mm-hmm. Um, you honestly against against someone that you didn't know was bad aggressive could even think about folding here on the flop. That said, I probably wouldn't for a min raise, but I would definitely uh, plan on being done to any action on the turn. 
mm-hmm. right? Um, so I think it's fine to call here, um, and uh, and plan on check folding the turn because players are way more likely to bluff. Uh, there's like a sliding scale here. This is actually kind of interesting. Um, players are like if you consider like how often how likely people are to bluff, it's just like it goes, uh, you know, reasonably likely on the flop, not very likely on the turn, very unlikely on the river. And so we can actually make, even against passive players, we can still make the occasional flop call with a hand like top pair there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, we just can't really pay off all leader streets. So actually, I don't, I don't hate the way you played this hand. Um, I think this is actually fine. Okay. I was, I was actually going to make all kinds of criticisms about it, but then as, as we played it through again, it looked good. <laughs> <laughs> um, good, good re-raise for value here. Now, here's another interesting question here. Uh, pause the tape for a second. Um, one of the important things to think about is how our how the perception of our range will exist in the in the mind of what we're going to call a good aggressive player. Which, by the way, is what we're going to classify this under the gun raiser as on the bottom right table. Mm-hmm. Right? He's a regular. He three bet us. You know, he dealt, he continued with aggression. He's, his bet size has seemed okay. You know, this guy seems like he knows what he's doing. Like that was your perception, also, right? Yeah. Um. So if he's thinking, we have to play by a little bit of different rules, which is that we have to we have to go now no longer assume he's just looking at his cards, but also that he's looking at um, what uh, you know what we might be doing. He might actually have achieved the ability to think about things at the very least a little bit in relative hand strength. So in this sense, um, let's for a second here instead of being in the small blind, let's put ourselves in the big blind. Okay. Okay. It might be better to think about calling here and check raising any flop. Why might that be? Because if I'm re-raising an under the gun raiser from the big blind, mm-hmm. that looks pretty really strong. Mm-hmm. And I think that he's gonna fold um There's almost, only a few hands a, yeah, there's only yeah. a few hands that he's really gonna pay off with. Mm-hmm. And those hands, by the way, are he's still really, really, really likely to pay off with post flop. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, let's say, you know, he's got pocket kings, right? Mm-hmm. It's a very rare situation that we're not going to stack pocket kings post-flop. Right. So, you can actually make a decent argument for saying, well, we're much better off, like, letting him keep all the king jack stuff in, letting him flop top pair and taking a ton of money off him like that, than it is uh, just trying to, to maximize value as it is. So, put it this way. If I was in a spot where I thought the guy was really likely to play back at me, like let's say this guy was in the cutoff and we were on the button, I would three bet my aces all day. Right. You know? right. Um, but under the gun raiser versus blinds, you actually might want to start thinking about flatting. And the last good reason for flatting is the fact that this Mr. White, number seven, whatever, on your left, um, is not very good. Mm-hmm. You know, you might be able to get extra money by calling or by calling and let him come along. And then you could actually think about like leading flops like we talked about before. Okay, yeah. I don't know if we talked about that last week, but I've talked about it in the past. The idea of, you know, if you're multi-way, um, there's no guarantee that someone's going to see bet. And if there's a fish in the pot, you should probably go through the process. You know, can I bet for value, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that said, clearly it's not bad to three bet aces. Um, especially if you think that he will call you with worse things, which is a reasonable, you know, argument at this limit. Um, that he'll call you with his ace ten and his jack ten suited and all that stuff. So uh, roll the tape and let's see what happens. Show what do you want to ride with me? We can get low. So this is uh, not the best flop in the world for aces, but not as bad as some. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I know. I butchered this hand and I couldn't wait to. Tell you first. So now we're basically going to have to check call down because it's too likely that he'll be thinly value betting us with some kind of a. T- Ooh, we're gonna bet, aren't we? <laughs> Why don't we go ahead and pause the tape here and we'll start off by talking. Okay. Um. Uh, having trouble pausing the tape there. there yeah. Sorry. Um, it's okay. Um, clearly we want to bet this flop because we can still get value. Mm-hmm. You know. Ace queen, king queen, king jack, king ten, pocket kings, all hands we can get value from. And even if he has like one of the most common like hands that might beat us, like say queen jack, we're still drawing pretty live against queen jack. You know what I mean? We we still have what? 
two, six, nine outs against Queen Jack, like we're still fine against Queen Jack. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's a spot where you could actually make a pretty good argument for potentially bet folding. (laughs) You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. I, if, if you if you raises in, on this board, like it's pretty unlikely he's got anything worse than a set or a made straight, mm-hmm. because he'll be afraid of us having a set or a made straight. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think we can actually bet, and if we get called, bet all the way down. Now we may value own ourselves against uh, Queen Jack, but we'll also stack you know a lot of Ace Queens and King Queens and stuff like that. Um, that said, so we decide to check. Um, checking is okay against an aggressive opponent why do you think that's okay um because they'll be betting a lot of worse hands right when you check call this flop what does he put you on most likely uh maybe one of the hands that we just talked about that i mean he he might call us with right something like ace jack I, mean, for, I think we check calls a lot. Like we look like ace jack, ace ten, king jack, like that yeah. a lot, a lot more than like pocket aces. Mm-hmm. Right. And so give him a hand like ace queen or king queen. Right. Mm-hmm. He might ha- talk himself in, if he's aggressive, firing three streets for thin value. You know, say, ooh, I got top pair, good kicker. Like he check calls, he can't have aces, kings, or or a straight. So as he check calling, like I've got him beat. So I'm I'm just gonna keep on going. So in this sense, this is actually a move that you might see at, like, high stakes a lot where people are really aggressive. Where, like, you know, if somebody check calls here that you might see somebody value stack off with ace jack. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Just, like, fire, 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 try to get the guy to call him down with, like, ace 10 or whatever. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, so in that sense, like, if someone's really aggressive, this is a good line. However, what I would say is that people at this limit probably aren't that aggressive. Probably aren't thinking aren't bold enough to value own themselves that badly like he probably will shut down with his king queen on the river or something mm-hmm. you know what i mean um and so we're better off just going after value ourselves okay so now that we've check called our plan should be to check call down but we decide to get weird and bet and that's a butchering <laughs> oh it gets worse just wait all right so we bet and maybe he shoves all in here now and then we should fold to a shove here on the turn i think I don't even know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what to do to a shove here. It's like, I've got, okay, so, ooh, we spike. <laughs> we spike an ace. Of course we do. She immediately goes for the tie bank. <laughs> That's awesome. The mouse, you see the mouse is going for the tie bank. <laughs> tie bank was even there. Um, uh, so now the question is, can we get value? I don't know. Um, honestly, like it's pretty close between going for, like going for value and uh, and check folding. I think that I I would prefer here to bet like uh, half pot and fold to a shove. Yeah, that was my plan. Well, we bet half pot and he shoves, and then we go. Oh, but there's so much money. No. Don't tell me we called it off. Did we call it off? No. No. Fold. Yeah, we fold, but I I didn't like it. I mean, I didn't like. The fact that I played so bad that I had to, that I had to do this on the river. Yeah, me neither. You know what I mean? So, so like, I don't know. I if, guess, you, if you but... do this right, this is how this goes. This is honestly how this goes. You bet turn, he or you bet flop, he calls. Mm-hmm. You like pot turn, he puts in whatever is left. You call, he tables the king queen. You go yes. You spike an ace. You go no. Right. Mm-hmm. That's that's how that hand is supposed to go. Right. Um. And, and you know, in the in that telling of the story, we get all the money in good. Mm-hmm. Um, in this spot, we we get a huge bet in bad. Right. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. we're we're still doing it because we still think he's, he could potentially call us with worse. Um, but uh, honestly, the, as I'm thinking about it, like if the ace peels off, that means there's only one ace left in the deck. It's pretty hard for him to have ace queen, and it's pretty unlikely he's going to call with any kind of um, two pair that doesn't have an ace in it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, the more I'm thinking about it, like I think it's got to be a check fold. Okay. Um, and not just because that happened. I, I I'm just like looking at my own thought process back before and thinking that it was bad. Yeah. Um, there's just not enough hands that we can get value from. So we go through and say, can I get value? It's just too optimistic, especially once we consider that if he had a set, he probably shoves it on the turn. Right. Right. You know right. I mean? mm-hmm. Um. 
And so I think it's just I think it's just too optimistic. I think that we we look. I mean, the fact that he shoved the river means that he had king queen or king jack. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's sickening for us because we we should be much we should be getting good value from that. We should also be raising the ten nine for value here against this limper. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Remember because what I was saying I... about isolate about protecting your isolation. This is a big example of that. Um. Do you remember well, that? This, yeah, I I do, but. That's, but I was kind of confused because, I mean, if I say can I risk value or, or if I'm isolating, I'm isolating him with ten highs. That right, but remember that a huge fact, a huge, the probably the biggest part of getting value from him is having him check full on the on the flop, or just full on the flop, or more even more importantly than that, having him uh, just make bad choices later. Okay. You know what I mean, so we have a lot of value that's not that's basically present in the fact that um, in in our skill advantage basically. Okay. Um, now clearly we're like hooray right now, but uh, maybe we get sacked by East Ten. <laughs> but um, I still th- I still think we're probably good. Yeah. Um, well, I decided to just get it in because I think he called with all two pair, and also I didn't want like a nine to come or something. Yep, sure. I mean, is that- Once he raises this flop, he is never folding to a shove. Okay. Um, and you're exactly right. There's a lot of cards that either beat you or kill your action. Tough. <laughs> um. <laughs> A lot of cards either beat you or kill your actions, so you want to get it in. You want to get it in now. And okay. by the way, like let's say for example, you call there and he had instead of king queen king jack, and that mm-hmm. queen comes. You know what I mean? Yeah. That kills your action. Yeah. Um, and so you're you're exactly right. There's a lot of cards, both hidden and non-hidden, that kill your action or beat you. Um, you're much happier just getting it on the flop, and you, you know that by the way, once he raises on that board, he's always raising for value. And if he's raising for value, he's got a hand. And what do people not fold? Hands. Exactly. So even though, by the way, against the donk shove <laughs> with uh, on a king queen jack board, he should fold mm-hmm. his king queen. He'll never do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? He'll never. Yeah. Do that. Um, and then once I didn't raise preflop, and that fish was in the pot, and he and the big blind raised, and the fish called. Is the call there? Okay. Oh yeah, the call. The call's fine. Closing the action, play a pot with the fish, that's fine. I would rather just take the initiative and play the pot with the fish myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and if the other guy comes along, that's fine. We're going to play really, really well post-flop. You know? We've got great post-flop rules. We're, we're comfortable and confident in them. Like, at the end of the day, you know, you say, oh, I, I don't know if I can raise 10 high. Well, it's like, oh, well, would you raise jack high <laughs> if you had jack 10 suited? <laughs> yeah. What about queen high? It's, it's not like there's you know, some magic line that's like, oh, this is good and that is bad. Yeah. Like, uh, like if you ever look at, by the way, everyone who's watching this, if you ever see like a small stakes forum where somebody's like, oh, I would raise ace queen there every time, but I would always fold ace jack. <laughs> it's that, don't listen to that guy. <laughs> yeah. Because, because ace queen, ace jack are almost the same hand. Like, it's very, 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 very close. And, uh, oh, terrible river card for you. You know, right? Wow. <laughs> Not running the goods right now. Not running the goods. Um, on the bottom left, yeah, I, I raised a nice C bet that flop, mm-hmm. and now with the hand, like now with this draw, I I didn't know whether I should. This is actually a little bit of a closer spot than the other one, or a little bit of a better spot to bet than the other one, okay. um, because uh, there are a fair amount more hands he can fold, um. Okay. I think he, he can potentially, with an ace on the board, lay down a queen on the turn. Not to mention he'll lay down like uh, a lot of flush draws or make bad calls with them. Either one of those is fine. Um, and uh, and so, you know, I think we're I think we're better off making a bet there. But once again, it's close. We're gonna talk um, after we're done watching uh, um, some of this video, which we'll do for another like 15 minutes or so. Um, mm-hmm. We uh, we're gonna t- we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, when what, like that exact situation. When do we want to check? You know how, what are the rules of of uh, of checking back versus betting the turn? Maybe a little bit more sophisticated than we have already. Good. Um, he, the, and then that guy said, "Regret slow playing that." Really? <laughs> yeah, it's like what, what what could you have had there, buddy? <laughs> like we had everything. Yeah. So maybe you had pocket fives, in which case, yeah, tough scene for you. But like, uh. <laughs> Still, there's like nothing you could have had, so you're probably lying. <laughs> not, not, no sixes or aces left. Cool. Um, I mean, th- this is one of those things where, uh, 
like even though we aren't running great, it's all going according to plan. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? We get we get the money and good on the top left. We're we're you know value betting appropriately on the bottom right, and we just get a shitty river card. Um, you know these are things that if we can tough out the times when they don't go well, um, when they do go well, we'll go on some huge upswings. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like we may we may stagnate for a little bit, and then as soon as things do go well, we make so much money. Mm-hmm. So, so so far so good. Yeah, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna ask. Do you ever have nemesises or nemesis online? Like one player who just like always seems to... crushes my soul. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. Sure. Um. No, a, a big part of that high stakes is is that uh, like the player pool is pretty small. And so you see a lot of the same guys over and over again. And, like, you know, at least for me, the guys that I would see are really good. <laughs> are yeah. really, really good. And so, like, some guys some you know, some guys who have run really hot against me in the past, like, own me. Some guys that I've run really hot against probably think that I own them. I mean, think about, there's a guy, uh, Pork Tom on Full Tilt that I'm, like, up, like, probably 40K in equity against <laughs> Pork Tom. But then again, like, you know, guys, great players like I Rock Hose or, or Derek JC or Anski, like, are you know crush my life <laughs> because you know it's just when when you when you're up against a good thinking player and we're, we're going to talk more as the series progresses about how to deal with a good aggressive players mm-hmm. you know we the, the first two episodes of this have been primarily about how to deal with uh bad passive and bad aggressive mm-hmm. you know we haven't dealt a ton with um good aggressive we're going to start actually a little bit today at the end of today's session um we're going to talk a little bit about um how we make some adjustments uh, when dealing with with good aggressive players, um, but yeah, I mean, sure, that's part of history. Everybody has their has their like <laughs> evil twin who who crushes them sometimes. Because <laughs> <laughs> honestly, it's starting to become this fu Oliver guy, the one who had king queen when I had nine ten. Yeah, like, it seems he plays a lot, and I was playing on a few tables with him, and when I got it in good, he stuck out, and then there's other times where you know I had ace queen on a um, a queen high board, he needed kings, and I just felt like he was, and he was three betting me a lot, and so um, I'll be glad when we start talking about how to make some adjustments again against him because I tried a couple things and they just weren't working. So sure, F well, you, this, this, is, this is the next challenge because there yeah. guys like that are going to start to exist more and more and more as we move up. Right. That said, let me tell you some things you can feel good about. Right, the fact that we donked into a fish on a king queen jack board and he raised and then stacked off with top with two pair mm-hmm. right tells us he's not really aware of table dynamics okay you know what i mean mm-hmm. like he should definitely just call there <laughs> you know what i mean mm-hmm. he should definitely definitely just call there um and uh cause, you know keep the fish in the pot like his value is not very clean, especially considering how strong we look by betting into the fish three-handed. Um, and so, um, ooh, this is actually kind of interesting. A big part of me here wants to check. Really, because it's so dry. Yeah, because we, we, when we talked about times to slow play, or when we, it's basically impossible for us to be outdrawn. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and there's a lot of room for our opponents to catch up. And we don't need to start building a pot. The pot's already built for us. That's true. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like, even if we check back, if, if Paul Rizzo bets the turn and we raise, we can still get stacks in. Okay. You know what I mean? Anything that somebody's stacking off with, there's no scare cards, there's no beat cards. You okay. know what I mean? Like, there's, I mean, maybe a king would be a scare card, but <laughs> in general, there are very, very, very few scare cards um, against, or that could beat us or scare other people. So in that sense, you know, a big part of me says maybe we should think about checking there. Um, uh, especially if we're trying to play like deceptively and get Paul Paul Rizzo's money, um, because like we talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about you know how to beat um, uh, you know good players, and he's apparently a regular. I don't know if he's good or not, but he's apparently a regular. Um, and uh, you know maybe adding a little bit of deception in a spot like that is a good way to go ahead and, and beat someone like that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Get him to stack off with something that he might not otherwise. You yeah, know? I just yeah. Well, I was thinking because we're. So- so deep, but I guess I still had enough room to to try and um. I mean, clearly, clearly, you're not wrong for betting. That's I'm, I want to make that clear, right? Clearly, it's not a like a minus EV decision or like it's not arguably the best choice, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, especially with this this guy who used to stack, who didn't seem like he was very good. Um, that said, um, you have I guess the the concept I'm trying to drive home is that when you when you can't be outdrawn and the board right, can't right. get scary and the pot's big, those are all ingredients that should point you towards a slow play. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you know maybe maybe it was right in that case maybe it wasn't I don't know but what's important is that you at least think about it you know what I mean yeah, that definitely. this thing comes down and you go hmm is this a slow play and then you weigh out the situations in your head and you say no nah, there's a fish in the pot like I think I can just stack him now or you say mm, yeah it is because I want to play deceptively against the regular at the table because we're deep and maybe I can get a stack from like a weak holding yeah definitely you know and mm -hmm. so I mean the kind of thing where like let's say uh he has queen – what? Let's say he has a queen 10 there, and we check, and the trick card's a queen, right? And we bet, and he calls on the river card's a 10. You know what I mean? Now we start like be able to get a lot of value from that type of hand. Or you know, maybe he runs down two queens, or maybe he runs down you know some kind of two pair or, or you know lower set. How about that? You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe we check back, and he has pocket fives and spikes a five. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. There's a lot of permutations of stuff that could happen that are good for us and very few that could happen that are bad for us. Yeah, no, it's definitely a good point because sometimes I, I'll get too into the routine of just, like, value betting everything all the time instead of, you know. Well, and that's not bad in the sense of, like, we know that's our plan. You know, that's what we, that's what we're, how we're gonna how we're going to win. But this is how, like, I guess the introduction to us talking about how to play against better players is – you know, what we're doing right now, the whole purpose of these first two videos and the, the coaching that we did before was to create in you a ABC game, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, we should maybe think about three-bidding those fours there. Okay. Unless that guy left a fish, but I don't think he is. Mm -hmm. um, but, but basically to create in you an ABC game, a, okay, we go for value, like pot, pot, pot. Okay, we win a big pot, etc. right? And that ABC game will work against fish forever. Don't tell me you're going to raise this. What do we talk about, Christy? If I don't have a lot of product thing, I just, yeah, you're right. <laughs> we, Christy and I, in our coaching sessions, did a basically exact, this exact same hand where we raised and the guy called and then we check fold the turn. Or no, we made a bet on the turn or something like that and it got shoved off <laughs> or something like that. Um, the, uh, the problem with raising a hand like pocket fours there is that we just don't have enough equity. When we get called, we never win. Mm -hmm. And that's bad. Um, we'd much rather have like two over cards or like some kind of draw, a gutter even. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. just you know, we a little bit more equity because we need him to fold there like all the time. Mm -hmm. And we're especially against guys you don't love to fold. We're probably too optimistic in thinking that he will fold that much. Yeah. But anyway, getting back to what I was going to say about playing against this Paul Rizzo guy, one of the things that you know, we'll need to do to play against players who are a little bit more thinking is be able to go to that next level. Basically, to be able to say, um, you know, I, I know I could bet for value here and it wouldn't be wrong, but I don't need to because there's extra value in maybe, you know, waiting. One thing we talked about last week was if there's value now, I want to take it, right? Yeah. The only time that I change my mind about that is if there might be better value later. Okay. You know? We talked yeah. about that. Uh, I forget exactly the hand we talked about last week. But uh, we basically said, you know, if I want value now, I should go. It was, oh, it was the three bet with ace-10 in position. A guy raised, and we had ace-10, there was a fish in the blinds. Mm -hmm. And we were like, well, should we three bet the guy with our ace-10, or should we call and try to bring the fish along? And the, that's the exact question we're going to ask is, is the value now better than the value later? And in some cases it is, in some cases it isn't. And in that pocket seven hand, I kind of think that it maybe isn't. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and in the ace ten hand, like it maybe was better okay. um, to get it now. I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's 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 very close either way, and that's what being a poker player is all about: is like figuring that stuff out. <laughs> yeah, um, we we might be able to raise that for value, the king ten, okay. especially against this fishy player. Okay. Um. And uh, clearly now we're going to start value betting him because there's a lot of pair plus draws he could have now. Um, let's see if he decided to make it. Yeah, that's good. I think it's good. Um, cool. Why don't we watch this tape for another five minutes? Okay. Um, I think I think we can raise and get value from like a lot of like random mid pairs there. Um, okay. That he, he's gonna he might call a raise with because it looks bluffy on the flop, but uh, you know then check fold this room. Um, 
So, if we know this guy is kind of like bad aggressive, this is fine with the Ace-9. Mm -hmm. We just have to recognize that, you know, we are about to stack off versus an under-the-gun Razor with Ace-9 offsuit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. we have yeah. to have a really, really, really good reason uh, for that. Um, now, this guy being, you know, 89 11, there's a pretty good chance that, you know, we are going to get our money good. But that said, like, our hands equity is a little bit weak. Um, and yeah. now, clearly, we're going to shove here to collect, you know, to make him fold that equity. And we're going to have to call a shove when, if he shoves. I can't remember what he did. Once again, we're getting two to one. The whole point of us raising was that we thought he would cause a lot of worse hands than ace nine. A lot yeah. of his hands bricked. This looks pretty bluffy. Um, I would I would call there, and mm -hmm. so that's a that's a small mistake. But we just have to recognize that you know if we're gonna three bet a guy that's that short with Ace Nine, it's because we're not planning on folding at any point in the hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Definitely. Um. Okay. Cool. Um. Yeah. Let's watch a little bit more. I mean, it's it's I gotta say like it's this video from where we started at the beginning of a coaching sessions is is kind of cool. <laughs> kind of freaking cool, um, but but get, I want to get back to talking about this Fu Oliver guy mm -hmm. um, for the next five minutes or so before we stop watching the tape and before I enter like the last concept that we're going to go over. Um, uh, it's really important that you not let a personal relationship with a player at the table um, influence you emotionally mm -hmm. in your decisions, and it's really hard to do, especially in heads up. Um, in a heads-up context, I don't know. You, I don't think you've played very much heads-up before. Mm -mm. Um, like the way it actually tends to run is, it runs at least between two regulars. It runs in huge landslides. Okay, mm -hmm. you would think that two relatively evenly matched guys would play relatively evenly matched. But what ends up happening is one guy runs kind of good, and then the other guy basically gets frustrated emotionally because of the one-on-one -on -one context. And it turns into like a massacre. <laughs> and that's just the, anyone who any heads up regular knows that's how it goes with right and w against another regular. Um, mm -hmm. You and like but one of the great things is knowing how to quit. <laughs> so what you know at the beginning of your own disastrous landslides. We should fold the king three to a min raise there. That's not very good. Okay. Um. Uh. But I guess I guess the the point that I'm trying to make um, is that uh is um. That just because we have a relationship with this FU Oliver guy, we have history, right? Mm -hmm. um, let's let that not really affect our game. Let's like let it affect his game more than ours. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like he like let's not spaz out. Let's do things. You know, let's stay in control. And a lot of players have a hard time staying in control, especially when they go against regulars. Which, by the way, will happen. Was the reason why a lot of regulars have a hard time getting past like one two. Mm -hmm. They they lose control against their quote unquote nemesis. There's all these you know one two battles <laughs> going on, and the guys who beat those who, who get out of those are the ones who don't really care. <laughs> right. You know the guys who are just like doing their thing, grinding, and then eventually they they move up. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, it's a fine spot to fold with the jack eight suited. Against a fish, we might raise for value, get the full, but against that guy, like probably not getting a lot of value from that. So it's okay. Right. Super interesting. Super interesting. Uh, yeah, so I three bet and got just cold called from the big blind. A cold call by the fish and got called by the regular. What do you think my plan of action is going to be against either opponent? Um, bet call against the fish, bet fold against the... You got it. Reason. You got it. Not bad. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and... Why don't we go ahead and pause the tape? Okay. And uh, we will talk now about the last thing I wanted to talk about, uh, which I've been hinting at all this whole time, which is um, our turn play in general. Um, and the, the whole pot equity, fold equity equation that I've talked about so many times and um, when that doesn't work, <laughs> when that's bad. Okay. So um, I want to – this is actually going to be kind of cool. I want to um, rephrase this pot equity plus fold equity equation. And I want to call that depolarization. Okay. Does that make sense? Kind of. Let's think about it. When we're three bidding against bad players who we expect to call us out of position, not four bet us, but call us, mm -hmm. 
we choose hands that are that have some kind of equity, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We have pot equity and we have a little fold equity and we raise, right? That's mm-hmm. how we take our ace nine and our jack eight suit and all those stuff, right? Those raises are no different than than betting the turn with like our flush draw. Okay. Do, do does that make sense? Yeah. So in this sense, we're betting the turn um, with pot equity and fold equity, but really we're betting um, as with a depolarized range. Okay. okay. Preflop. When do we start to polarize? When do we decide to drop that strategy and and decide to polarize our range? When someone is for betting us or folding. Exactly, because the extra equity that we have we waste by getting raised, mm-hmm. right? Like if we three bet our queen jack and the guy four bets us, we have to fold, which kind of sucks because we probably could have played the queen jack profitably in position if we just called, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. right? Um, so the same thing happens against good aggressive players on the turn. If somebody turns their range into raise fold on the turn, they will beat our strategy. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, against a really aggressive player who's going to play raise fold, all of a sudden we polarize our turn play. We check back our good stuff and we bet our stuff that has no equity whatsoever. Okay. Now, it's really tricky to to use that because normally people feel much more comfortable by just calling. Mm-hmm. So the, I, I, it's really I'm not necessarily giving this to you to use right now, but okay. I'm giving it to you and to everybody else out there who's waiting for me to come up with something new that's interesting, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, because it's something that as you start to play against better players, um, especially those few mid to high stakes players who will actually watch this video, <laughs> um, this is something that like is really 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 important to know. A lot of players get in this ABC game like we were talking about where we you know we bet the turn with equity like we our turn range for betting is so is easy to figure out <laughs> you know what i mean mm-hmm. everybody knows and they also know that if we don't bet the turn on a, on a draw heavy board most likely we don't have a flush draw mm-hmm. so when the flush comes on the river like they can represent it and we can't um and so being able to check back against these types of players is good for us for all kinds of reasons so the point that i'm getting at here is this if somebody is really, really, really likely to call you, you need a lot of pot equity and bet, and you should bet with it, right? Mm-hmm. If you bet a big draw, the only disaster situation is that you get raised off it, right? Mm-hmm. The good situations are the guy folds or you see a river. Those are both good for us, right? Mm-hmm. The only bad one is we get raised. But given that in these limits, we're not going to get raised very often, this plan works. The plan that I've given you works. Right. So then the next question is, if I need a lot of pot equity, how much do I need and how much fold equity do I, you know, do, do I need? Um, these questions are feel questions. These are not math. I mean, they could be mathematically expressed, but you won't have time to do that when you're playing. Mm-hmm. So there were a couple times where we had the king high diamond draw on the turn. One of them was on a uh, 10, 7, 7, 4 board or something like that. And the other one was on an ace, queen, 4, something, 7 board, I want to say. Um, and the question was on both of them, like, should I bet here? Should I check? To be perfectly frank, I don't know. <laughs> But at these limits, I would incline myself away from betting the turn in these spots. Okay. Because people just don't like to don't like to fold. My fold equity is very, 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 very diminished. But as soon as I start to play against the regular, if I was playing against Fu Oliver and he check called me and I picked up a diamond on the turn, I'm gonna fire every time. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because that guy is probably gonna do things like say, "Ooh, I have you know, top pair no kicker and I'm taking a lot of heat on this board. Like I might have to fold." Okay. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so uh, and so, we can start to become more aggressive. We'll become more aggressive on it with our turn play um, as we sort of get through this mid-stakes range. As we start to get higher stakes, we might have to like change our play and, and uh, polarize ourselves. Um, 
but in, in low stakes, we stay depolarized. In mid stakes, we'll stay depolarized, but we'll get more aggressive on the turn. Um, and then high stakes is, like I said before. Um, okay. All that makes sense? Yes. Do you have any more questions before we sign off? No. I think. Cool. Well, thank you all for listening to me and the Ninja Dolphin uh, talk about poker. <laughs> um, great. Good session. Um, how are you feeling? Feeling good. Good. Gonna get back on the horse today. <laughs> back on the horse, make a little bit of money, play well is what's important, go through the process. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for watching. Uh, only at DeuceTrack.com. This has been Andrew Beluga Whale Sideman with Christy the Ninja Dolphin Arnett. Have a good one, guys. Peace out.